This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Thank you all for coming this evening to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. We are happy to have again with us a special visitor, Hawaii State Senator Mike Gabbard. As many of you know, he and his family are dedicated vegetarians, including his daughter, Congresswoman-elect Tulsi Gabbard. He has a few words he'd like to say. Senator Gabbard? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's our former president, Dr. Ruth Heydrich. Hello, Akako. It's nice to be here again. For those of you that were here, how many were here last month for Dr. McDougall's presentation? Okay, good. I want to talk a little bit about some legislation that's going to be coming up. And but before I get into that, I want to make the, uh, a presentation to your guest speaker tonight, to John Cadman. John, would you come up, please? We have a presentation to make from the Senate. I usually don't read the whole thing. It's actually quite short, and I, I do want to read this. It says, who would know best about the needs of our keiki when it comes to school lunches, but someone who has been hands-on and behind the scenes in cafeterias for many years? After cooking up gourmet meals as a chef at Maui Resorts, John Cadman worked for 15 years as a food service manager for the Hawaii Department of Education. He now serves as the Food Service Director for Kamehameha Schools, Maui Campus. Mr. Cadman's experience in our school lunchrooms has given him a unique perspective that something is seriously wrong and he is doing his best to get the word out and be the change. As a vegan, Mr. Cadman has been determined to give students healthy meals with great veggie options that they enjoy even though he has to work under strict nutritional and budgetary constraints. He is famous for his vegan Baja Burger, which I have not tasted yet. His Baja Burger recipe that is so nutritionally complete that hungry students can eat as much of it as they want. With a large family of active sons, Mr. Cadman has certainly had this recipe tested and approved by the toughest critics. Mr. Cadman is stepping forward to let the public know that the National School Lunch Program, which mass feeds 30 million school children a day in this country, is in desperate need of reform. With subsidies and handouts of surplus commodities, plus other foods from government sources, this is the most popular, yet flawed, social welfare program in our nation's history. Everyone who loves a school child, cares about the well-being of the next generation, or pays taxes, should listen carefully to Mr. Cadman and get involved. The Senate of the State of Hawaii hereby honors and commends John Cadman for his dedication to revolutionizing our national school lunch program for the benefit of our planet, our budget, and most importantly, the health of our keiki. We wish you success in creating the healthiest possible future for our children and for our, for our country. Congratulations, John. As I mentioned last month, when uh, Dr. McDougal was here, back in 2008, we had introduced a concurrent resolution. That's the House and the Senate together. We passed this resolution. Senators Sakamoto, Chun Oakland, uh, Senators Fukunaga, myself, and Senator Nishihara. It passed both the House and the Senate. And basically what it said was it requested the DOE to develop nutritionally sound public school meal plans that include vegetarian options. Now, the way things work down there, usually when you pass a concurrent resolution, when both chambers pass something, whoever the agency that is requested to do something, they usually pay attention and they usually do what you ask them to do. I'm sad to uh, report that in this case, the Department of Health didn't do anything about this uh, resolution that we passed. Very disappointing. And basically what they had said, we received a, a paragraph or so about a year later saying, well, our hands are tied, you know, we have to stick very closely with the nutritional requirements from the federal government, et cetera, and so we can't really do what you've asked us to do. 
In addition to 2000, in 2008, we introduced a bill, uh, Senate Bill 2136, with the help of uh, Dr. Bill Harris and others in the Vegetarian Society. Uh, it was deferred, which means the chairs of the Senate Health Committee and the Education Committee, they heard it, but they didn't want, they didn't want to act on it. And that particular bill would have required DOH, in consultation with the Department of Education and the Department of Agriculture, to develop suitable public school meal plans for vegetarians. There were 38 people who testified, who came down or, or submitted testimony through email or letters in support, 38. There was only one in opposition, and that was the Department of Health. On the bill, SB 2136, there were 29 who supported, sent in, either came down in person or submitted public, uh, uh, testimony in favor of, and only one in opposition, and you guessed it, it was the Department of Health. We are going to reintroduce those bills. I got a, a nice email from Dr. McDougall. Uh, he was inspiring to me because when we talked afterwards, he said, let's do this, let's work together. And he offered to come back to Hawaii on his own dime and testify at our hearings in support of this legislation. Now, someone with the international, quote unquote, notoriety as Dr. McDougall will be very helpful in our attempts to persuade my colleagues, both in the House and the Senate, to pass some of this legislation. But we need your help as well. And so if you will just please, uh, either through my office or capital.hawaii.gov is the, is the legislative uh, website. Uh, I'm sure you'll be, uh, Dr. Harris again is helping us uh, craft, tweaking the legislation that we used before. But we need your help. And by help it means if you can come down and testify in person, that's wonderful. If you can't, then please send in your testimony, okay? And so if you have any questions about this, please contact my office. But it really makes a difference. The more people we have involved, then the more chances we have of getting some good legislation passed this time. So thank you very much for your time. Aloha. Thank you, Senator Gabbard, and congratulations to Ch Chef John Cadman. It was a very well-deserved award. I would like to say a heartfelt thank you and regretfully farewell to one of our most valued and dedicated volunteers, Denise Snyder. She'll be relocating with her husband to College Station, Texas. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I hope people will please step up and volunteer because it's been one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done, and you may not think you have a lot to offer, but you will be surprised. So please step forward and, and volunteer. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is now time for a special guest speaker. We're very happy to have with us tonight Chef John Cadman. John Cadman is a vegan chef who has successfully worked for many years to offer healthy and student-pleasing foods, including veggie entree options in lunches at schools, both private and public. A native Californian, John earned his bachelor's degree in science from Oregon State University and moved to Maui 30 years ago. He started his food service career at the Hyatt Regency Maui Resort and Spa at Kanapali Beach, moving on to several other top hotels, then opening the Four Seasons Resort Maui at Wailea, where he stayed for five years, eventually rising to the level of sous chef, overseeing three restaurants and the banquet operations there. In 1996, he started a 15-year career with the Hawaii Department of Education working first as the food service manager at Haiku Elementary School and then at King Kekaulike High School on Maui. He has also been a lecturer and instructor at Kaiser Permanente's wellness program and at Maui Culinary Academy at UH Maui College. For the past year and a half, he has been the food service director for Kamehameha School's Maui campus. John, his wife Danielle, and their six children live in Haiku, Maui, where John and his four oldest sons love to serve. His current passion is creating fabulous new vegan desserts. His presentation tonight is entitled, There's No Such Thing as a Free Lunch.
please welcome Chef John Cadman. Welcome everyone, thank you for having me tonight. I should make one disclaimer real quickly that I do work for Kamehameha Schools Maui. I am speaking tonight as a private citizen. I do not express the views or the stance of, of Kamehameha Schools. I have a lot of passions in my life right now because I have my health and that's what I'm so grateful for. Right now, this is last week I made Ulu chocolate pudding. At, at the school. I, I, w I got involved with Ulu a few months ago. I, I spoke for the Hawaii Farmers Union over on Maui and they asked me to do a talk on breadfruit. So I learned about it and I realized that breadfruit is an amazing, amazing fruit, vegetable, whatever you want to call it, because you can use it for everything. And if there's one food that were to embody the whole sustainability movement, it would be breadfruit, hands down. I entered a, uh, a cook-off in Hana and I won not just the first place, but I won grand prize with this Ulu Dynamite. So I've been making Ulu recipes at, at school. This, this was the, the, the first week I got it in, actually. We're fortunate on that. We have the largest collection of breadfruit in the world. And this talk is not on breadfruit, so I'll move on. Don't worry, Bill. This is a vegan recipe, the Ulu Dynamite. It was veganese, uh, sriracha, sauteed in coconut oil, the, the, the breadfruit with shiitakes mixed in with the sauce, and then a little furikake and green onion in a little wonton cup. It's fabulous. And my other passion right now is making raw desserts. And this is a, I entered a pie contest two weeks after that. I won that one too. And I beat out Mama's Fish House. I beat out Moana Cafe, all these top restaurants, Leota's Bakery. And this is a raw mocha pie with a, a mac, macadamia nut, coconut, date crust. That's all that's in the crust. And the pie consists of basically cashews, almond milk, coconut oil, vanilla, and raw cacao powder. And uh, Oh, so let, a little less than two, which is, and so anyway, it's fabulous. Raw desserts are the way to go. I love raw desserts. And my other passion is surfing. That's yours truly. That was just two weeks ago. I'm 52. I'm ripping, aren't I? That's a pretty big wave. That was actually the inside of the wave. The bigger outside, it was even bigger. And, and you know, without my health, I couldn't do that. Health is the most important thing we have, and I'm so grateful for that. And exercising is great, but you know what? I couldn't do that if I didn't have my health and I didn't eat it properly. So anyway, today's topic. So let's get to the topic at hand. You didn't come here to see pictures of me surfing, and I didn't bring raw desserts, so I'm not going to tease you with that. We're going to talk a little bit about school lunches. The, you know, a lot of people like to point fingers at school lunch, and there are plenty of fingers two-point at school lunches, but what I want to try and do is give you some information that will help you if you do want to get involved and at least to help make some, some decisions and, and help you understand a little bit more why we are where we're at. Here's a lunch in Singapore. Now I know this is a vegetarian society. A lot of, most of these lunches you're going to see aren't vegetarian, but they are, you would call this plant-based because most of these dishes on this plate are based around plants. So pretty darn healthy. Here's one in China. Fish head may not be looked too appetizing, but again, plant-based. France, France is known for some of the best school lunches in the world. If any of you have seen any, again, plant-based. I love this one. Look at this one in India. You know that's vegetarian. Most of them are Hindu. I love the banana leaf, yeah? Boy, if we tried to serve food on the banana leaves here, we'd get railroaded out of town. South Korea, again, plant-based. Sweden, even Sweden, look, potatoes, cabbage. That's lingonberry juice, I looked it up. Looks like a nice little whole wheat cracker there. Japan, little miso soup, little pickled vegetables there, small piece of broiled fish, rice, again, plant-based. Finland, not bad. My son's lunch last Thursday. Of course, you see the milk there. There's your vegetable, those french fries. Very small portion of tuna fish. He's in high school, by the way. Applesauce was effort. Could you see applesauce on that plate? Everything would be the same color. There's no life to that. That was his lunch yesterday. A little better, at least, I will say that. There's at least some green on there. So that was good. That was my lunch last Thursday. That's what I, that's what I eat for lunch. I ate a, a big salad for me. However, 
30 million meals a day, and this is typically what is offered. This is what I call an industrialized lunch. Chicken nuggets, tater tots, the milk, which has to be served on every school lunch, or at least offered, two chocolate chip cookies, and then an orange, which sadly enough is probably the one thing that ends up in the garbage. Where is the love? Even this one, okay, there's green beans on there. I don't know if I would eat those green beans. It doesn't look like there's any kind of flavor or seasoning on those. The corn, same thing. And even if you did eat meat, that chicken looks pretty scary. There's no mashed potatoes, no gravy. Where's the love? I don't know, not on that plate. You know, and given choices, the poor ones are usually made, to be really honest. Now, this is a typical scene. Now, let me dissect this picture for you. We'll do a little investigative work here. I'm looking down on this. I would say this is at a school that is run probably private, that's privatized, either Chartwells or Sodexo. And I say that because one is nobody has a, a glass of milk there. I'm sure it was offered, but they, they have these cans that they're probably some type of juice. And there's a, looks like a vi that blue bottle is vitamin water. And they've got two pieces of pizza, so that's obviously the entree of the day. But look, there's a bag of potato chips there. There is a little ray of hope on that table. What do you see? It looks like a pretty good little bowl of, veg or of fruit there, which actually, if you look at it close, I think there's a kiwi in one of those. But this is typical of what the choices that would be made. History of the school lunch program. The Congress actually created it after an investigation into the health of young men rejected in the World War II draft showed a connection between physical deficiencies and childhood nutrition. So Congress enacted in 1946 the National School Lunch Act as a measure of national security to safeguard the health and well-being of the nation's children. And so Harry Truman signed it into the School Lunch Act, June 4, 1946. Now, interesting dilemma here. We created school lunch to feed the hungry. Can we now ask it to fight obesity? And that's what we're doing. A little bit of a challenge there. And it's funny because the military just came out maybe a few years ago and was saying that it is an epid of epidemic proportions is our obesity conditions that we have in this country. And it's actually excluding about 25% of the applicants, maybe more, I forget what the actual number was, but it's a huge concern to the military now. They can't get enough young men that are fit enough to join the armed forces. They used to be malnourished and now they're overfed. So the school lunch program today, federally assisted meal program operating in over 100,000 public and nonprofit private schools and residential care institutions. It provided nutritionally balanced, low cost or free lunches to more than 31 million children each school day in 2011. And this is straight off of their USDA website. So the nutritional guidelines are that the school lunch program is to provide one third or more of their RDA allowances of key nutrients, okay? They are not required to provide no more than 30% of calories from fat and less than 10% from saturated fat. The biggest change that has come about in school lunches, and this was just basically enacted or instituted this last school year, came out of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 which makes sense. It takes a couple years for the government to get around doing the things that they do legislate. And what that did for the first time, this is a statement from Secretary Vilsack, statement on the passage of this. He said, allows the USDA for the first time in over 30 years, opportunity to make real reforms to the school lunch and breakfast programs by improving the critical nutrition and hunger safety net for millions of children. Specifically, what did it do? Well. The new guidelines set calorie limits, increasing daily servings of fruits and vegetables, adding more whole grains, and reduced saturated fat and sodium. So they essentially doubled the amount of fruits and vegetables that are to be offered in the school lunches. But unfortunately, they are so mired in, in other guidelines and regulations that they sort of painted themselves in a corner. As I, I said, they set calorie limits, okay? So in order to do that, they had to reduce the amount of grains and protein that can be served in a week. Here's some the differences. The old standard for lunch required that a daily minimum 825 calories be offered 
to high schoolers, okay? The limits are about 100 calories for less for middle school and 200 less for elementary, but we'll stick with high school for now. It used to be a minimum of 825 calories, okay? The updated standards have a minimum of 750, but a maximum of 850. So, theoretically, the new larger vegetable and fruit portions, which are lower in calories, have replaced fattier food, should still leave students feeling just as full as before, but with fewer calories. But all of this is with the assumption that they actually are going to eat all those fruits and vegetables. The federal reimbursement for these new standards is six cents. And their studies have been done that's costing anywhere from 32 to 48 cents to implement these new guidelines. So it, it is a costly move. Everybody gets a maximum of 850 calories. These high school girls, 850 calories. These football players, 850 calories. High school, of all ages, you will see the biggest, most diverse and significant difference in the size of the kids of just about any age. So to, to say everybody has to have a maximum of 850 calories is not realistic. And I don't think it's, that is where they, they sort of painted themselves in this box. Because they said we have to address obesity. The only way to do that is to lower caloric intake. And so they put that limit on there. Well, there was a huge repercussion on that. These students in Kansas actually did a music video called We Are Hungry. Anybody heard of that? The, the, it went viral. And it's basically they revolted over this 850 calorie limit. Give me some seconds, I, I need to get some food today My friends are at the corner store getting junk so they don't waste away My lover ate two grams of meat, just about to starve My bread was taken by some school bully, asking about some more And I know I gave up on food months ago I know I'm trying to forget but between the milk and feta cheese, the pains in my tummy sing, you know. I'm trying hard to find nourishment, so if by the time you go to practice and you feel like falling down, I'll carry you home tonight. So, after a lot of this pressure and, and a lot of complaints, this just came out, they decided to lift the minimum of grain and proteins, okay? I'll, I'll go ahead and read this. Uh, announced release of new guidance, which eliminates the weekly maximums for grains and proteins under the new meal pattern, okay, for the remainder of this year. It is yet to be seen if they're going to extend that. However, calorie maximums for school meals will remain in place. I don't know how they're going to do that. If you take away the maximums for grains and proteins and yet keep the calorie restrictions there, you, there how do you do that? That's where most of the calories were coming from, right? The, the, the meats and the, and the grains. How does the government keep the cost of lunch so low? Well, this is where the welfare aspect of it comes in. First off, federal commodities, okay? Government provides school lunches with a lot of federal commodities. About one billion a year, USDA pays for commodities. And when I was in the schools, we had all sorts of federal commodity foods. Some good and some not so good. We, m majority of it were things like ground beef, American cheese, our bleached flour, um, rice. Occasionally, though, we would get 
we, ha we would get frozen blueberries and frozen strawberries. So there, there were some good commodities that we would get occasionally. But the fact is, the way sc most school lunches are, our cafeterias are run, they use the ground beef. They use the cheese and the, flat, and the white flour. There's also federal subsidies along with the commodities, quite a bit more actually. So in 2011, federal spending totaled about 10 billion into the school lunch program. So 10 times the amount of federal commodity. The federal commodities basically are just given to the schools free. And then the $10 million that comes in the form of cash reimbursement for each meal served. So these reimbursement rates, just to give you a little idea of how much per each lunch, a, a, a student that qualifies for free lunch would get, the, the school would get $28.86, a reduced would $2.46, a full price student, they would receive 27 cents. Alaska and Hawaii, slightly higher. And then, of course, there are state subsidies, okay? Hawaii being no different. In Hawaii, the public school system, there are 172,104 in 256 public schools in Hawaii in 2012 and served about 100,000 meals each day. You know, sadly, the participation goes way down <clears throat> as you move up in grades. About 90% of the elementary kids eat school lunch in Hawaii, about half in middle school, and one in five in high school. Now, the high school I worked at, Keikaulike, I had, I actually am proud to say my participation was about 40%, which still doesn't seem like a lot, but it was double, actually, maybe even higher, maybe closer to 50%, actually which is really high for a high school. The other half of the kids didn't bring lunch, and it was a closed campus, so I'm not really sure what they did. I assume they just didn't eat, you know? That's the sad part, because there's a non-competitive uh, food sale policy in all of the DOE schools that are receiving federal subsidies. There can be no other food sold on campus when there's a school lunch being sold. Okay, and in, in the DOE, Hawaii DOE, you can see 36% of the, of the cost of the meal comes from the federal government, 33% Hawaii state taxpayers, 26% comes from lunch sales, and then about 4% from the federal commodity. Here was the lunch prices in 2012 in Hawaii. Elementaries, 225, secondary, 250. Reduced price still pays 50 cents. And if you want a second entree or a second meal, it would cost $5, which is about the cost to prepare that meal when you count labor and food cost. It's about $5, a little bit less. That's about the national average, our school lunch prices, maybe a little less. So in Hawaii, about 53% are either free or reduced. And the remaining 47% pay full price for their lunches. Let's get back to the purpose of the school lunch. It provided nutritionally balanced, low cost, or free lunches to more than 30 million, 31 million children each day. So the question is, what is nutritionally balanced and low cost? Okay, and this, this is from a paper that was written who, if you can see the authors down there, the middle one, Glenna Owens, she is the director of school food services for the state of Hawaii. All children are offered foods that meet on a daily basis federally mandated nutritional standards, which include age appropriate calorie and nutrient levels. And she is sincere about that. And the fact is that I think for the most part, when schools do follow the, the menus, guides that they, guidelines that they have, they do meet the federally mandated nutritional standards. You know, the, the question is, are those acceptable? Nutritionally balanced, low cost lunches. That's where we really gotta look at it. That's where I would probably have my biggest disagreement because they've been saying this all along, that their meals are, are nutritionally complete, that they follow the USDA guidelines. So if that's the case, first of all, let's look at this lunch. It's a nacho lunch, okay? That's on the lunch menu in Hawaii. 
To me, I don't consider that nutritionally balanced. It may meet the fat requirements. It may have the meat component it needs. The chips, by the way, are the bread component because corn is considered a grain. The potato tater tots is considered a vegetable, full of fat. And then there is an apple there. And the milk, of course, has to be offered. I wouldn't call that nutritionally balanced. The government does, but I don't. This is what we have. This, this is the result of our nutritionally balanced approach. I'm not saying school lunches got this kid fat, but school lunches are a part of the problem. Look at what happened. Diabetes, obesity rates have all skyrocketed, tripled. And it's all from diet, clearly. Michelle Obama's whole let's move campaign, that's all smoke and mirrors. It's not let's move and eat healthier. Did you notice that? All the big companies, and I'm digressing a little here, but all McDonald's, they'll pay your school to put in gymnasiums. Pepsi, all the big companies. They'll, they'll pay millions to build parks and things so kids can exercise. Why is that? Why do you think that is? So they can take the tension off diet. Yeah, we're supporting physical activity. Anything but talk about eating healthier. Physical activity is great, it's important. But when you let your kids eat like this, this is what happens. And they're incapable of physical activity. But our society has got it all wrong. And when we look to our government to say, this is a nutritionally balanced meal, a plate of nachos with cheese sauce that's full of fat, are you kidding me? Come on. And low cost. Yeah, that's true. Of those 30 million meals, percentage-wise, 15 million of them are eaten for free. Ate free today. What's on the menu? Well, hon, we've got salads, fruit, and whole grains. Or you can choose a lifetime of obesity and related health problems such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. Here's one of the problems. You know, I, I stated that the school lunch program was really started to, to help the malnourished kids. You know, there was maybe some underlying. It was actually also so the government could buy up surplus food from the farmers, which in the beginning, after World War II, was a good thing. They needed help. They helped subsidize, keep the farmers growing food. They didn't know what to do with the food, so they figured, let's start a school lunch program. We can give it to them. And, and that's how this whole welfare approach started. And we're spending $30 billion a year to subsidize corn and soy production right now. It's a little chart. I don't know if you can read that too well, but the majority of it is corn, then cotton and soybeans, wheat. There's even sub tobacco subsidies. I didn't even know that. Dairy and rice. What, where does that the corn and soybeans go? Well, most of the corn into our food supply is high fructose corn syrup and hydrogenated soybean oil that are foundation for almost all fast foods and processed foods. And since the 70s, when our agricultural policies were changed to support corn and soy farmers, we're consuming, on average, an extra 500 calories daily per person. And it's mostly in the form of artificial high fructose corn syrup. Here's another aspect of the problem. These foods go into, transform into our industrial food supply into things that we call food, okay? And this is, this is a really huge aspect of it. It's important to address. I couldn't even believe when I saw this. This is Candwich, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in a can. I don't call this food. Can anybody guess what this is? What's inside of this? And the whole point of this is, is if you were a kid, you wouldn't really care, would you? Like, you'd want this. That is just cool. I can win a banjo bash, and it's got an Xbox 360 thing up there. Anybody guess what's inside of that? It's a Lunchable box. That is criminal. That a, that a company can market something that they call food in a box like that, that you clearly is, is aimed right at the children. This is from a Fruit Loops box. Look at what all these th claims on this box of Fruit Loops that this is somehow healthy for you. Smart Choices program, guiding food choices, I, whatever that means. And then on the bottom, it now provides fiber. It's a great way to keep kids healthy. But you're supposed to equate the Fruit Loops with a great way to keep kids healthy. I know for a fact Fruit Loops are over 50% by weight sugar. This is not food. It's not food. 
that people need to realize that this is just bogus. This should be on one of those Saturday Night Live things. Seriously? Wonder Bread? Look at the, the claims they make. Good source of whole grain. No trans fats. Good source of vitamin D and E. Excellent source of calcium. Good source of fiber and folic acid. Wonder Bread. Nothing for you. They used enriched flour because the flour has everything taken out of it. Here's the latest, and this, this actually, I think the marketers realized they went too far on this one because they're pulling this. Cherry 7-Up, it's got antioxidants in there. Are you kidding me? They, they have pictures of cherries, blackberries, cranberries, and pomegranates on various 7-Up labels. The drinks contain no fruit or juice of any kind. What they do contain is high fructose corn syrup, citric acid, potassium benzoate, and red dye 40. So fortunately, they actually the manufacturers realized, you know what, I think the government even sent them a letter like, you know what, maybe we shouldn't make health claims on soda. So let's get back to school lunch. I digressed a little bit. But what are some of the hidden costs of the school lunches in America? Well, the hidden cost is health care, truly. Should you picture those little boys? If you think eating healthy is expensive, you haven't priced cancer lately or a triple bypass surgery or quadruple. This came from the Millikan Institute. An unhealthy America, economic burden of chronic disease. It reported that seven chronic diseases listed below cost the nation 1.3 trillion annually, including almost a quarter billion. In addition to that, 1.1 trillion in lost productivity. And that sum equates to $361 per person in America for 2007, just for this, those seven diseases. This number implies that treating chronic disease costs more than the extra cost of eating healthy. So we may think we're giving these kids a free lunch, but if they keep eating like that, and again, not just at school, but we feed them what they like, which is the pizza and chicken nuggets, they're gonna develop diabetes very likely, they're gonna become obese, and they're gonna develop one of these chronic diseases that we're talking about. And they're saying now that the additional medical spending due to obesity is double previous estimates and exceeds even those of smoking, a new study shows. 190 billion a year in additional medical spending as a result of obesity. And this is in addition to those seven chronic diseases. Okay, so, so again, this is our salad bar at Kamehameha Schools, Maui. You know, you can't necessarily force kids to eat healthy. However, they need to be given a healthy choice. They need to have healthy options available to them. I'm fortunate enough to be able to have a salad bar at Kamehameha Schools, although most of the DOE schools have been offered and are trying to get salad bars in there. And as you can see here, we have, we have mandarin oranges, there is a garbanzo bean salad that I made, cilantro, lime juice, cumin, a little garlic, salt and pepper, black beans, red chilies, and, and garbanzo beans. It's got cucumbers, olives, edamame, tomatoes, and then a mixture of salads that we purchase locally. Holy watercress, red leaf, green leaf, that's grown about five miles from our school. Interestingly enough, as far as the nutritional guidelines go, this, with the exception of a bread component, which we did have, we had rolls offered. And, and we, do, we do offer milk, but we also have juice machines. We offer 100% juice. <clears throat> but with the bread and the milk being offered, this would be a complete meal because the beans would be considered your meat alternate. And then of course, you're, you have your fruits and vegetables and you have lots of diverse colors. And the kids love it. I also offer nutritional yeast for the kids to shake on their salad. And a lot of the kids make huge salads. And we put leftovers on it too, because high school kids are hungry. They want to eat, they really do. Wellness classes for kids, got to start them young. I love this picture of this little girl doing, I don't know whatever yoga pose that is. Look at that smile. Cooking classes, kids need to learn how to cook. Kids need to get, just like getting their hands dirty in the garden, knowing how to grow vegetables and grow food and, and, and even just knowing where our food comes from, you know, being able to cook. And, and not just for older kids, but even for young kids. That little aspiring young little chef here. And here's a, a big thing, and this is one of the, the biggest problems. This is a typical lunchroom scene. Could be any high school in Hawaii. It's, if you know what 600 high school students looks like coming, the new definition of the term a cloud of locust. 
And it's, it's just wrong. You should not have to eat your lunch in a crowded, hectic environment where kids were literally trying to, to cut in line, run out the indoor, just f to get lunch. Um, nutrition awareness is really important. You know, we need to bring that awareness of, of, of the connection that food has with our bodies to kids. And that's a hard one because right now, the connection that the USDA has with the school lunch program, they say they're serving nutritionally balanced, low-cost meals. They say that. They don't really think they're doing anything wrong. And so therein lies one of the challenges, is you know, how do you get the true message across? But you know, for a lot of people, they don't get it. They don't understand that a study will come out that says drinking milk is good or eating meat is just fine, or that sugar, it's made from real cane sugar, not corn syrup. What they don't understand is there, there is a, a trillion dollar food industry out there that is funding all these studies, okay? Milk, you know, if I had to pick on anybody, milk's just as good as any one of those industries. Who, who do you think is non-biased here, right? If you're gonna fund a study, and you're selling all the milk, the 30 million pints or half pints of milk that gets sold in school lunches every day, you're gonna darn well come up with a study that finds that milk is good for you. And there's a lot of ways to do it, right? They can do a study that say kids that you know, need calcium, oh, milk has calcium, so it's good for you. So people are getting these conflicting reports and they don't understand how much bias that these studies have and the authors of these studies that are funded by the industry has. But again, that's the challenge because the USDA right now is setting the guidelines. You know, there's, there's personal responsibility versus governmental regulations. I mean, how much do we put on personal responsibility? But then there needs to be some governmental oversight. Like, this is classic. I could not believe I found this. Look at this, these two billboards. Look at the top one, childhood obesity. Don't take it lightly. And right below it is a billboard for McDonald's. So there is obviously room for both of these, personal responsibility and some governmental oversight. So that's the question. But bo bottom line is there is no such thing as a free lunch. There isn't. Basically the five categories for a school lunch. You've got your dairy. That's literally a sacred cow. <laughs> that's not going anywhere anytime soon. The students don't have to take it, but there's nothing else offered usually, unfortunately. You have your grains, okay, which can be met by rice, unfortunately nacho chips, and usually it's a bread item. The, the, the positive note is they are using half whole wheat flour now in Hawaii, and they're also using 50% brown rice is good. And then the other three categories, fruits and vegetable kind of, now they've lumped them together into one, fruits and vegetables. And then the protein or the meat or meat alternate. Now the good thing is serving a vegetarian lunch is not that hard because there are a number of meat alternates that you can serve. You can serve beans. In fact, tofu actually got approved as a meat alternate. Believe it or not, for the longest time, tofu wasn't an acceptable meat alternate in the school lunch program. And you can do a ton of things with beans, right? You can make ch chilies and mix them in. The, it's the Baja Baker that he was talking about. I mix refried beans in with a baked potato and then, and then stuff it back in and bake it again. So the beans count as the meat alternate. The potatoes, I throw green onions and seasoning in there too. But those, the potato is, counts as a vegetable. And you can put in some fresh chopped parsley, and it comes out really good. Bill really liked it. And with a little nutritional yeast in there, that, that turns out to be a complete meal. I would do a lot of vegetarian chilies. Just leave the meat out. That was so long ago, I actually won a bean recipe contest. It's like a sloppy joe made with beans, and that's a really good one. They don't add up the, the vitamins and minerals and that kind of thing. It's just these, the serving size, the amounts. So if you give them a half a cup of beans, that counts for two ounces of meat equivalent. So it's not hard to serve a vegetarian 
meal in the schools. The challenge is, is serving one that will be edible. There's not a lot, but there is a good number of, of students that really like a plant-based diet. And, and it's sad because those students right now are either not eating or either having to sacrifice what, what they normally eat because of a lack of choice. At Kamehameha Schools, there's a couple, uh, I have a couple vegans and we got to talk with them and it was just, it was really neat to hear their stories. And so I've always tried to, to have healthy options. What we thought we would do today is just get some of your thoughts as to like what has been your progression. So here we have, we have Amber, Kappa, and Makana. Have you gone to school here always? I've been here since sixth grade. Okay. I didn't really think about becoming a vegetarian until like my sophomore year in high school. We actually like, for the longest time we'd be like, hey, let's be vegetarians and we just it's never started. <laughs> <laughs> when I got towards like halfway my halfway through my junior year, like towards like beginning of like semester two, like New Year's resolutions and stuff, I kind of was more determined to become a vegetarian. Um, mainly, I guess, because of like the whole how things are getting into a lot of GMO and like chemical things, and I'm kind of worried about it because I want to eat healthier and kind of you know try to eat more fruits and vegetables, just be an overall healthy healthier type mm -hmm. of person. My first goals were like not eating meat every other day and then, like I do that for like a month and then after a while I got to the point where I'm like eat meat only once a week on certain days and then I got to the point where it's once every month and then I got to the point where like now I don't eat meat at all like my mom and my brother both still eat meat so that has to kind of work around them. I saw a documentary this past summer about um, mistreatment of um, animals I guess like even like dairy suppliers and stuff, and that's kind of sparked me to become a vegan. And so hopefully I'm gonna take those small steps and this time next year I'll be a, a vegan, like a full vegan, hopefully. Do you know about the vitamin B12 problem? I do not. If you go on sure. a vegan diet, make sure that you get a dependable B12 source. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the one thing missing from a vegan diet. You can do it in supplements, tablet. but that nutritional yeast that I have out there, mm -hmm. take a look at the, the fact sheet that I have along with it, and you'll see that it provides a couple hundred, up to 500% of the, the USRDA of, of all the different um, vitamin Bs. Okay. And the cool thing is, and I learned this from Dr. Bill, who used to be an ER doctor at Kaiser way back, is that B12, the, that's the one vitamin that is not found in plant foods that your body does need. However, your body stores it so it's not like you have to eat it every day. Oh. So Kappa, what's your story? My name is Kappa and I always kind of thought about being a vegetarian, but when you're in a family of five, it's really expensive. Yeah. I first started stop um, eating like dairy products. So I didn't like just straight up ones. Like I didn't eat cheese or butter or drink milk anymore. Cause um, I had a really bad acne problem. And then my doctor said that that might help. So I did that and it kind of cleared up a little bit. But then um, I decided that I should just stop eating meat because I did it slowly though, because it's hard to just <laughs> instantly stop. I think I did it more for the animals than for myself because they're mistreated and everything. And I really like animals. So yeah, I just kind of started slow and then now it's at the point where I just don't eat meat anymore. <laughs> At first, my family was really reluctant about it. My mom bought a vegetarian cookbook. We kind of work around it a little bit, like we go to the farmer's market now because the vegetables are cheaper there. Absolutely. And it's like local business kind of a thing. Right. Yeah, like so my parents are okay with it now. At first, they were kind of like hesitant. Sometimes my mom will make me food, and then sometimes I have to do it because my mom says that I need to learn to start taking care of myself. <laughs> do you agree? Yeah, I do agree. Because um, actually, I want to go to culinary school and then kind of pursue like a more vegetarian cooking kind of a thing. The thing is right now there's this shift and, and I think Amber's story really showcases the, the, the progression that people make. You know, it's not like Star Trek where people just get transported automatically from one place to another. <laughs> it's this gradual process. It's for different reasons, you know. It's for health. It's for the, the sake of the environment. It's, it's how you feel. Makana with the food in front of her. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was doing this. I know, thank you so much. So I watched um, an episode on Oprah with my mom 
last year in May, and it was about veganism and like um, it, it covered a whole variety of like angles as far as vegan goes, um, like the animals and also your health and stuff like that. Um, so my mom and I decided to try it out for a week. And so I did it for a week and I decided to just keep doing that. It really helped that I started out with my mom because we were cooking together. You know, I, I kept it going for a few months and then I kind of gradually went back into vegetarian. I kind of became vegetarian, but I always keep in my mind to try and be as vegan as possible. What's the difference? Well, <laughs> vegetarians, I feel like they eat um, dairy and eggs and sometimes fish, whereas vegans don't eat that stuff, like dairy products, eggs and fish and stuff like that. And what has been your experience with school food as far as coming to CAM and even prior to this, like at other schools? Like, I wasn't a vegetarian until, like, last year. And then, so I like that um, you had vegetarian options. Definitely. Yeah. Every once in a while, that was really good. Yeah. Like, yesterday, when you had the chicken curry, I love curry. So I was just like, <laughs> don't get the chicken. Around <laughs> <laughs> right. the chicken. Yeah. I, um, I love the soy milk in the morning. Oh, oh me that too. That too. Yeah, that's great. And it's, you know, it's been surprising to me is when, when we, you know, we make our own granola here, and we put out soy milk, and it's amazing how many of the students love soy and almond mm -hmm. milk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I so like I'm really milk pleased too. with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. prefer almond milk myself. But that, do you find that that it's it's challenged sometimes? Or oh yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of people have no idea what it is yeah. in the yeah. first place. Yeah. So it's like, the, like what are you doing with yourself? You know, yeah. Yeah. especially being from Hawaii, it's like spam and yeah. salmon yeah. and all that kind of Sausage. stuff. Like, yeah. 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 And, uh, where do you plan to go to college? I'm um, going to Boston. Are you trying? Um, Bentley or Emerson. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. With the Emerson. goal of pursuing? Um, audio technology. Wow. Good for you. What about you? Um, I'm planning to go to UHMC because they have um, a really good culinary program. Yes and it's kind of cheaper to stay here. Sure. And yeah, I figure it's a good place to start. I'm currently looking at Vassar in New York, Drexel in Philadelphia, not Philadelphia, sorry, um, in Pennsylvania, and Occidental in California, mainly. To major in? Um, I want to do environmental um, science and agriculture. And I think that's where one of the biggest changes is taking place because, you know, some of those, those bogus ads we were looking at, this, those misrepresentations, you know, the, the young kids are smart. They, they see that and they're really aware of that. And, and when they see those kinds of ads, they, they put it on like our generation is trying to pull a wool over their eyes. So I see that as a good thing because they're rebelling against that. And, and there's more vegetarian kids now than ever. You know, when I first started, just maybe a, a few here and there in each grade, but now there's, there's, there's a good number of kids. Like, I can watch the kids that come out of my lunch line at Kamehameha Schools, and I'd say 30% of them have, maybe not vegetarian, but I would say have the majority of their plate is, is salad, you know? And the neat thing is we offer a salad, as you saw, that, that is substantial. You can put your beans and legumes and, and things on there. But given that choice, a lot of kids take that today. So I think there's a definite shift that's taking place. You know, my breakfast usually consists of fruit, some nuts, uh, maybe some almond butter. They, my mom just doesn't get it. Like, you just, that's not food. You know, they grew up with, with that thinking that just meat and dairy was the backbone of all your diets. And here they are sitting in their, their lazy boy chairs with these ailments that are a direct result of their diet over all these years. And they just, unfortunately, they failed to make that connection. Okay, so how does the salad bar come into play <clears throat> with the calorie restrictions? That's, that's a good question. And there is no real way to define how much calories anybody would be getting if you were offered a salad bar. So I think their solution to that was that, that a student would take what they would do is just count, you're supposed to have a cup of fruits and vegetables, so they would, they would count the number of calories in one cup of fruits and vegetables that came off that salad bar. 
So they wouldn't look at each individual plate. They would just assume that everybody would take a cup's worth, which is obviously not the case. Some would take more, some less. So that, that actually, the, and that's the good thing about salad bars, it's a good, good question you had, is that it is one way to get a, around the calorie restrictions versus just serving it onto the plate. The current policy, and that they're working on changing that, is that any food grown in a school garden cannot be served in the school cafeteria. Food safety concerns. It's pretty ironic, isn't it? The food they're serving we know is killing us, but they're worried about the fresh cherry tomatoes that, that could possibly maybe not get washed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. And, and, and you know, that's a good point. You know, not to, to, he, he brought up the point that you know, when, when the parents are lazy, it's reflected onto the children. And, and, and the, the thing is, children do learn from what's served at home. Clearly, you know, they still eat more meals at home. And, you know, I'm not going to put the blame on, on our epidemic, you know, health epidemics we're having on school lunch. The gentleman back there, well, aren't they going to eat whatever that's offered? True. But if you give them a healthy option, most of the students would, would probably prefer the healthy option. Since beans meet the protein requirements of the USDA, John has created many bean recipes. Here are a variety of beans boiling together. Here is a recipe for black and white beans with a dollop of salsa between them. And here is one of his most popular school lunch options, the Baja Bakers, easily made by scooping out a baked potato, mixing it with refried beans, some salsa, and then stuffing the mixture back into the skins and topping it with breadcrumbs. So anyway, thank you so much for allowing me to come tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chef John Cadman, for giving us some eye-opening facts about our children's school lunch program and for sharing with us your insights that you've gained along the way. Mahalo to all of you, too, for coming tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your coming. We invite you now to have some delicious vegan refreshments. Mahalo for coming, and good night to everyone. Take care. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344, or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.